What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is B D G E. Make sure the mic is on. We are live. We are ready to roll. And yesterday's video, I basically went through picks one through twelve in fantasy football drafts, the entire first round. So if you missed that, go check it out. What we did was we went pick by pick and we talked about the floors and the ceilings of each player going off in the first round. And one of the top comments on the video was for me to do this into the second round. And I looked no further than my beautiful big dogs out there for guidance on content. So I figured we would uh, we would do that. We would just take players 13 through 24 according to underdog ADP. If you are not drafting on underdog, you're not doing the summer correctly. This is a surgical summer, okay? And a surgical summer requires you to be surgical in your fantasy football preparation and research. Thus, what you got to do is go to the description and it'll be the first link in there. You're going to click it. It's going to take you to the app store where you're going to download the Underdog Fantasy app. It's the best place to draft this summer. You can do fast drafts that are 30 seconds a pick, so it gets you properly, gets you properly prepped for your fantasy football drafts. These are best ball drafts. You're actually competing against people in money drafts, okay? You just don't make any in-season moves. No waiver wire, no trades, no sit starts. It's a beautiful thing. But the ADP, since all the leagues are at least $3 to buy into, they're all sharp as shit. And you're actually drafting against people who are playing for money. So you know it's going to be a real draft. When you use the promo code BDGE, when you deposit $10 on Underdog, which is going to allow you to do three or four drafts, you're getting a free $25 on top of that, people. So you're getting $35 to do 11 fucking drafts. There's only a couple weeks left in the summer, which means 11 drafts should more than prep you for your draft. And by the time you're done with this video, you'll know, based on yesterday's video, the risks and the rewards of players going in rounds one, players going in round two. Drop comments down below what kind of content you want to see going forward throughout the rest of the summer because you know we do videos every single day in August and September and October and fucking every day of, of the rest of my life. But y'all get the point. So if you want to stick around, if you want to continue getting notifications for the videos, make sure you have clicked the button right below that says subscribe and you hit the thumbs up button. And, uh, and thus, you should be able to follow me on the, on the, on the rest of the, the, the fucking journey that they call the offseason for fantasy football. So without further ado, we are going to tuck our shirts in. We're going to stop yelling and we go eat. The other obvious dub in signing up for underdog is you're automatically entered into the giveaway in which we're doing the nyc bdge draft weekend giveaway 11 of the subscribers are flying out to new york city one spot is given away by underdog completely paid for the entire trip is paid for by underdog because i love you because they love you uh all you got to do is use that promo code bdge when you deposit 10 bucks within the next what is it the fifth you guys are watching this only three days left only three days left to enter this giveaway okay so you're getting 25 dollars. you get an entry into the bdge giveaway and let's talk about their adp which is free to find on their app regardless first guy off the board in round two right now and he will continue to move down the adp but this updates as it has been throughout the entire offseason jonathan taylor jonathan taylor uh takes a monster hit with the news of quentin nelson with the news of carson wentz both are on timetables of five to 12 weeks we always side with injury pessimism thus we're going to go with the longer part of that and we're going to expect maybe quentin nelson comes back a little earlier because he's tougher but i feel like offensive linemen re-injure themselves often every time they got a calf pull or a groin pull or something they're back on the ir fast big fucking fast okay i don't i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shoot for best case scenario when it comes to the injuries on this offense which causes a problem for jonathan taylor uh jonathan taylor what he had going for him was being an elite runner behind an elite offensive line getting a lot of scoring opportunities without a quarterback without an elite offensive line you're looking at a very good runner that could still break away that could still get a lot of goal line carries but in an offense that doesn't necessarily give a lot of scoring opportunities with Jacob Eason likely under center. Uh, this is going to be a committee with Naeem Hines, who consistently ranks inside the top 10 in running back targets. They no longer have Philip Rivers throwing targets to the running backs, which means Jonathan Taylor, his upside is very capped. His floor is going to be like a boring mid, maybe high-ish RB2. He can come on later in the season for sure. He's definitely got the second half of the season ceiling going for him. But right now, uh, his ceiling is not top five in fantasy. I would say his ceiling is probably around eight to 10 range, which might seem high. But really, at the end of the year, you don't have to be amazing in fantasy to finish inside the top like eight to 10 fantasy running backs. So I think that's about his ceiling right now. And his floor is probably around RB 15, 16 ish, which is not great. Calvin Ridley's, however, is outside of injury. I just don't see any way which Calvin Ridley does not finish with 30% of the targets plus in this Falcons offense, 30% of the air yard share in this Falcons offense. It's hard to say that I could 
that I'd comfortably say his ceiling is as high as Devontae Adams, which is probably not, but no one on earth would be surprised if Calvin Ridley finished as the wide receiver one overall. So I would say that is without a doubt in his range of outcomes. The floor, I think, is super, super high if he's healthy as well. Unless you have all of these other really high ceiling players, Adams, Tyreek Hill, Stefan Diggs, even like the Metcalfs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Unless all those guys hit their ceilings, I just don't see a scenario in which Ridley falls outside of the top five or six fantasy wide receivers. So I think he's about as smash as they come in the second round from both the floor and ceiling standpoint. Nick Chubb, monster floor player, right? He will continue to be a top 10 running back no matter the year, no matter who else he's sharing the backfield with. Kareem Hunt is still obviously there and taking a lot of work, which is why we can never get as high on Nick Chubb as we'd like to because he's never going to catch 50 passes in a season, which limits his ceiling. I do think he could be a top four, five running back in fantasy for sure. Points per game, he was like number six or seven last year. The problem was uh, the same point I made with Derrick Henry yesterday is that even rushing for 2000 yards, Derrick Henry was still four to five fantasy points per game behind guys like Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey. They are the creme de la creme of fantasy running backs and guys who simply don't get into that 80, 90, 100 target range will not have the ceiling that those guys have. So if you're in a standard league, great. Nick Chubb can finish the year with 1600 yards from scrimmage. I still think he does not have the ceiling of those top end guys. If he finishes the RB, four or five wouldn't be surprised I think his floor is probably somewhere in the eight to nine range so it's a very safe running back that might not give you the league winning emphasis you need on the top of the poor okay DeAndre Hopkins DeAndre Hopkins had a monster year last year coming over for the first time in this Arizona offense though they do add some weapons they do add AJ Green they do add Rondell Moore uh this is a short passing type of offense. They didn't take a lot of shots downfield. So I think DeAndre Hopkins obviously locked in as the alpha there, a very, very high floor when it comes to fantasy wide receivers. Uh, His ceiling, I I think his target ceiling is going to be there. Volume, he'll be up probably in the Stefan Diggs range, probably higher than Tyreek Hill. I don't know if we're going to see the ceiling because I don't know if they take enough chances downfield. And the volume might dip a little bit with the new weapons coming into this offense. I don't know how much I I just trust Cliff Kingsbury. I love Kyler Murray this year. I love him. I love him. I love him. But a lot of that is fantasy upside because of his rushing and the amount of rushing touchdowns he scores. So D hop, I mean, like, listen, his range of outcomes is very small. It's probably like wide receiver four to three wide receiver, three, all the way down to like wide receiver seven or eight. So he's safe in terms of ceiling and floor. Fine, fine, fine pick in the middle, second end of second round. Uh, I don't like to go too high up on wide receivers. Obviously that's just my style when it comes to drafting Antonio Gibson uh, has a wide range of outcomes. In my opinion, do I think he has league winning upside? I do. He has everything that you look for in a league league winner at the running back position. Fast, big, explosive, will get all the goal line opportunities. He saw almost all of them when Peyton Barber got phased out of the offense after literally week one last year. They're an up and coming team, a new quarterback that should make the offense more explosive. Great defense, which should mean they should lean on the run game a little bit more. Uh, He's great pass catcher, great athlete. He's probably a year away from giving us that like Dalvin Cook, C-Mac upside, but he is in that mold of players where if he popped off for 1,800 total yards and 13, 14 touchdowns, wouldn't be surprised. He has elite, elite upside. The downside is this. He's going into the year with this turf toe still aggravating him as we've moved further and further into the summer. I'm getting less worried about it because all the reports are that he's okay and he's improving through it and he's rehabbing and he hasn't had any setbacks. Still, still a little, a little bit of uh, black pepper sprinkled into the coffee horrible analogy, but something that could still fuck you up without you being able to actually see it. Okay. So that's where Antonio Gibson makes me nervous. The other thing is JD McKissick is still very much there, right? We talk about Alex Smith being gone. So JD McKissick's targets are going to go down, but what if that just means the overall running back targets are going to go down? I know they're talking about playing him more on third downs, Antonio Gibson, but again, I've made this point so many times this summer. JD McKissick was a wide receiver in college. He is not James White. He's not Theo Riddick. He's not just a guy that you put in there, can catch a pass and then fall down with it. JD McKissick's a playmaker, man. J.D. McKissick is a guy that they could use to run a ton of routes. So I don't expect him to just be phased out of the offense because he is a good playmaker. So I'm a little bit worried about the ceiling of Antonio Gibson. Like, can we get an elite fantasy season out of Antonio Gibson if he only sees 50 or 60 targets when we have guys like Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott seeing 70, 80, 90 targets? That becomes the question. But you get him in the middle of the second round. So I would say his floor could be around where he finished last year, guys. I know you don't want to hear that. And I know him finishing as like the RB 12 to 14 is going to be very disappointing because he has RB2-3 upside, but I think he has a wide range of outcomes, as does Joe Mixon, who is the next pick off the board. With Gio gone, I do expect Joe Mixon to take a a lot more of the pass catching work. He's going to take the goal line work. Anytime he's healthy, he's basically seen 20 plus carries a game. I just don't think Mixon has been the runner that we wanted him to be. I don't think he's particularly elusive. I don't think he's particularly explosive. He doesn't really give us the home run plays, but if you're going to give a guy 20 plus touches a game, 
his floor is going to be super high. And now we don't really have to worry about Gio coming in, taking 30 to 40 targets off the floor, right? We don't have to worry about it being scraped off the stat line for a guy like Joe Mixon. So I know a lot of you guys have been burned bad by Joe Mixon. He was not a guy I was targeting the last couple of years. I'm back on board with Joe Mixon this year. We are fucking bike on Mixon. And uh, I don't think he's got the ceiling of what a lot of you guys are making out to be. People are making out the Cincinnati offense to be the fucking savior of the of the fantasy teams that are drafting players on this team. And I've been pretty vocal. Recently, I changed my tune a little bit, but for the majority of the summer and the spring, I've been vocal about Joe Burrow being uh, a massive fade candidate for me at QB9. And we just had reports come out yesterday, as of when you're watching this, that he still looks less than 100% on that ACL mentally, man. I cannot get this point. A lot of y'all will just never listen. A lot of y'all will just never understand this point that I've been trying to get across to you guys for like two to three years is that the injury optimism is just so fucking real in fantasy. And when it comes to ACL tears, the nine to 12 month return to play timetable is simply physical. There are a lot of dudes that need way more time than that mentally to come back from this. And from the reports that we're hearing at a Cincy camp, Burrow is still favoring that knee. And it makes sense because the ACL tear was not in preseason. It was not in week one. So that being said, he's going to be out on the field and he's going to be playing, which is great for Joe Mixon. This is not saying that I think he's going to re-injure himself and they might even lean a little bit more on Joe Mixon. But I think it's to say that like Mixon doesn't have 12 to 14 touchdown upside because I don't believe this offense is good enough to give him that many opportunities, if you know what I'm saying. I think I, I think he could end up catching 50 passes and he could end up with, you know, 290 to 310 carries. And by that volume alone, he'll be very good. But it, it depends if he busts off explosive plays. And we're kind of yet to see that in the NFL with him. It depends how many scoring opportunities he gets. This is still not a good offense, guys. I know they have a lot of playmakers, but their win total is six and a half. OK, they're one of the lowest in the league. I think they're bottom five in the league in terms of Vegas win totals. So as much as you can get excited about all this shit, Cincinnati offense, we're probably still one year away from seeing them be a real contender in this division. So Mixon, high floor, probably not as high of a ceiling as a lot of you guys are going to pretend that he has. Now, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, I think you can kind of slot them into the same role. Metcalf, I believe Metcalf has wide receiver one overall upside overall upside in fantasy football. Russell Wilson fell off at the end of last year as the DK Metcalf. It was a lot of this offense, okay? This was not defenses figuring out DK Metcalf. This was defenses figuring out this offense. And now they have Shane Waldron coming in, a much higher up-tempo offense is being installed in Seattle. I think it's going to be a lot more pass attempts for Russell Wilson. And when Russell Wilson gets a lot of pass attempts, which very rarely happens, he chugs out ridiculous touchdown numbers. And DK Metcalf, 23-year-old, coming into his prime, elite athlete, elite downfield threat is going to be the beneficiary of those fucking seeds out of Russell Wilson's fingertips, okay? DK Metcalf is not just a downfield threat. DK Metcalf is an elite separator, and we've seen that by Matt Harmon's reception perception of him. He can separate on any route. He's not just a one-trick pony like many thought he was coming out of college. So give me the up-and-coming elite talent tied to one of the most accurate downfield quarterbacks in the NFL. If we can get consistency for a whole season, this has been not a DK Metcalf problem, not a Tyler Lockett problem. This has been something we've seen from Russell Wilson every year. It's always first half, second half. Sometimes it's good in the beginning. Sometimes it's bad in the beginning and vice versa. If we can get a season where they put it the fuck together and they pass more, which is what this offense is sounding like it's tilting towards with the new offensive coordinator, bring in Dwayne Eskridge, early round pick, bring in Gerald Everett, pass catching tight end. Seems like they're going to go more pass heavy in 2022. So I think DK Metcalf's upside is legitimately wide receiver one overall. I think his floor, we could see another inconsistent year out of Seattle, of course, because we've just seen it so many times. At what point do you just say, if it's there, it's real, bro. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And we keep seeing the same thing. What if they just, you know, what if we come back next summer and we just say the same fucking thing again, right? What if we just say we need more passing volume from Russ for the 10th fucking year in a row? What if that just happens again and we get a similar year to DK Metcalf last year, which I still think is a low end wide receiver one or wherever the fuck he finished. He might have finished higher than that. Let me check. Uh, let me check the statistics. This the titties. DK Metcalf finishes the wide receiver five with 129 targets. The guys above him, 143 targets, 168, 134, 149. So if he starts getting to that 150, 160 range, he's going to be super dangerous. First half of the year, DK Metcalf was on pace to just blow defenses and they would make Rachel Starr feel like a fucking virgin. Okay, so DK Metcalf's upside is real. AJ Brown's upside, I think, probably not as high as DK's because Julio Jones is in the mix. But that being said, AJ Brown, you want to talk about low target totals and great finishes? AJ Brown last year, the wide receiver 10 overall. Actually, let's go to uh, half PPR. He is, on a points per game basis, the wide receiver 6. 14.7 half PPR fantasy points per game on 106 targets. Okay, 106 targets. Corey Davis is gone. Jonu Smith is gone. Julio comes in. There's no reason A.J. Brown coming into his third year 
also like Metcalf, prime, elite athlete, amazing young wide receiver. Also, in Matt Harmon's reception perception, one of the top performers of all time last year. Uh, he is very soon entering that Julio Jones peak prime elite range. Not a guy you want to be a year late on. I don't think he'll hit that like 150 target total. So I don't know if his ceiling is wide receiver one, wide receiver two, three. I think he has a very, very real chance to finish in the wide receiver three to five range with a with a floor of like wide receiver 10. Because even if he kind of reciprocates what he did last year in terms of targets, if he sees 110, 120, uh, which I think I, I really at the end of the day, I think him and Julio are going to combine to see 55% of the targets in this offense, right? 29, 28% to AJ Brown, 24 to 25% to Julio. Call it a motherfucking day and this passing offense is going to be super efficient. So on 110 to 120 targets for AJ Brown, the reason he's going to continue to rack those stats up even on low target numbers is because his catch radius is ridiculous. He's a great downfield playmaker. He's a yak god. So when he makes short plays, he'll run after the catch and he'll score regardless. So his floor I think is a low end wide receiver one. I think his ceiling is a high end wide receiver one, but probably not the wide receiver one. Najee Harris. I think his range of outcomes is very slight. I think his floor is, I mean, he's getting picked as like the RB 10 or 11 right now. And I think that's probably his floor. I, I don't see a way that he finishes outside like RB 12, 13, 14. I would be shocked because I think he comes into a spot. Uh, I've talked about him a lot recently. Mike Tomlin historically has always used his featured uh, running backs going back to the Willie Parker days, Mendenhall. Le'Veon Bell, D'Angelo Williams, James Conner, like you name it, anyone, anyone that's big, anyone that can play on three downs, which is exactly what Najee Harris is. This offensive line is going to stink. This offense might not be as good as last year, not as many scoring opportunities. But again, James Conner and Benny Snell combined for 10 rushing touchdowns, zero receiving touchdowns. So I think there's a, a very real outcome where Najee Harris averages over 20 touches per game, right? First round pick, 225 plus pounds. You don't draft a guy like that not to give him a, a billion touches. Uh, they don't want to lean on Big Ben's arm this year, okay? Because it might snap off if they do. And uh, that brings Najee Harris's volume floor really, really, really high. And he's going to catch a lot of passes, caught a ton of passes over the last two years at Alabama, great third down back, and should get all the goal line opportunities. So his floor, I think is really, really high from the volume standpoint. His ceiling probably capped. He's not a fast player. He's not going to break off big home run plays. Uh, and again, this offense and this offensive line probably cap what he can do overall on the rushing side of things, his yards per carry, his efficiency, things like that. I could see him finishing as like the RB8, and I don't think he'll finish lower than like the RB12 to 13. So I think he's a great end of turn pick there. Like the 201 to the 205 range is where Najee Harris probably should be going. Then we have Darren Waller, who I talked about Travis Kelsey yesterday. I think Darren Waller's range of outcomes, of course, he could end up seeing 30% of the targets in Las Vegas this year and and become the tight end one for sure. He could top Kelsey. He proved everything he needed to prove last year in terms of big plays, ceilings, weekly ceilings, uh, making plays after the catch, being a red zone target. Like he put everything together last year, a little bit more volume, a little bit more production. Uh, that being said, I don't know, dude, like, do we want to take a tight end in the second round? Probably not. I mean, his floor is great, right? Is he going to drop below tight end three or four? Definitely not because his volume is just going to be so fucking high and he's such a good playmaker with the ball in his hands. I don't know. What if uh, Henry Ruggs does something? What if Brian Edwards does something? Maybe they take a little bit of the volume, but probably not. He's going to be Derek Carr's favorite target. So I'd say his, his ceiling is tight end one. His floor is probably tight end three. And uh, I'm still not taking him in the second round. Clyde edwards Hilaire. I think this is a really interesting one. I think this is a really difficult pick. His ceiling, it's really easy to just say he's going to score. He can score a ton of touchdowns in this in this Kansas City offense, which he can. He can catch a lot of passes. But we kind of said that last year, and we didn't see target numbers out of him. And I think a lot of that has to do with the quarterback play because Patrick Mahomes is such a good quarterback. He's a, he is a thrower of the ball. He is not uh, simply let things happen to my offense. Don't take what's given to me. I would rather be falling down and throw the ball left-handed than take an easy dump off. See, that's the thing with Patrick Mahomes. He's a fucking slinger, okay? It's Tyree Kill, it's Travis Kelsey, it's Demarcus Robinson, Michael Hardman, anyone downfield instead of dumping off. That's just the type of player he is. He does not settle for dump offs, which I feel like caps the upside of a guy like Clyde edwards hilaire There's also a very real chance that Clyde edwards hilaire is just not very good as a running back. I know a lot of you guys don't can't admit that. It's really hard for you to say it. And I, I was high on Clyde edwards hilaire last year. I was very high on him. The situation said something, but I think it also says something when they bring in Le'Veon Bell and Le'Veon Bell starts taking away a fuck ton of touches from Clyde last year. Like they forced him into a tw uh, 20 touch role last year. And then by like week eight, he started diminishing. It was getting like 10 touches a game where every other rookie running back last year, who we also thought was in that same tier of talent, started in a committee and then worked their way into the workhorse role. He went the opposite way. So with Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, you're looking at a guy who's 5'7", 205 pounds. When I make the case for Najee Harris, you're going to say like, what about Clyde Edwards-Hilaire? It's like, yeah, but you don't draft Najee Harris as a 225 pound running back not to be the workhorse. Clyde could be a weapon in the Kansas City Chiefs offense. It could have been a luxury pick and it could be the same this year. They don't have competition in the Chiefs backfield, really. It's it's Darrell Williams. And recently they've been saying Jarek McKinnon might be the RB2 there. I don't fucking care about Jarek McKinnon. So 
he's got a high floor. I think the difference between whether or not this is a good pick is just simply whether or not he catches touchdowns. I don't, I mean, he's not going to get 280 carries, probably not going to get 75 targets, but there's a, an outcome where he scores seven touchdowns. There's an outcome where he scores 13 touchdowns. And obviously that's going to be a difference between RB 17 and RB seven, probably. So I, I think it's a gamble. I think there's a chance that you use your second round pick on a guy who's just like a middling RB two and he's super disappointing. I, I'm going to be honest. I'm a little more pessimistic on Clyde Edwards Lair than, than people are. I think down to pick 23 at the end of the second round, early third round, if he dips there, I think he's a fine pick. I think it's okay doing the risk and reward there for Clyde Edwards Lair. But I think there's a very, real chance to be honest with you at the end of the year we just look back at Clyde and we're just like exciting shifty player but just not that good of an NFL running back last pick of the second round Justin Jefferson and you might be asking why is he not in the tier with Metcalf why is he not in the tier with AJ Brown uh it's a good question I think we're all just so enamored with the physicality and the 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 fucking build of guys like Metcalf and AJ Brown Justin Jefferson I don't know if he's going to be able to realize his ceiling uh, statistically right now in this offense. Thielen's a very, very good wide receiver too, and this is a very light passing offense. That was a dumb fucking way to put it. But, you know, I mean, it's similar to A.J. Brown, man. You have him as a clear wide receiver one, entering his prime, taking over. You have a very good wide receiver two. You have a very strong run game. I think Minnesota probably has uh, a little bit of a better passing option behind their wide receiver two as well. So they have Irv Smith, they have Tyler Conklin, they have a couple other names that we've seen thrown around in the wide receiver group. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it just comes down to the fact that people think A.J. Brown's a little bit more built realistically. I think Justin Jefferson is, I mean, they're both top tier route runners, right? A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson are both elite separators. Justin Jefferson, 1,400 yards in his rookie year, setting the all-time record. What is the touchdown upside there? Hard to say, uh, but again, you can make the same point with A.J. Brown. What is your best get? Why can't I get on board with Justin Jefferson finishing as a wide receiver one? I don't know. There's something in me inherently that just doesn't think he has that ceiling. It might be something, it might be fucking stupid. I think he takes more red zone work. I think he gets more end zone looks. So I'm not sure why I'm hesitant to say that he has the the capability of finishing as the wide receiver one overall, but something in me just says he can't do it. His floor, I think, would probably be a lower end wide receiver one. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty and like think too hard about this, but if we start to look at some of the numbers and the analytics, like Justin Jefferson and Kirk Cousins legitimately hooked up on like, it, it, I forget the exact percentages, but I remember doing this research earlier in the summer. It was something like they completed 87% of their deep passes, you know, 87% of their deep looks that were targeted at Justin Jefferson was completed and it was like the highest rate in the last like 10 years. And it's like, okay, Justin Jefferson had so many plays where he just broke like 60 yards, 70 yard touchdowns. I'm like, that's just not repeatable. But the fact that he's such a pure route runner, he's like Keenan Allen with speed means that those 15 and 18 yard gains like consistently weekly fucking play by play are going to be there. So he'll have, I mean, Justin Jefferson is going to be amazing as a wide receiver. The question comes like, if he's not an elite wide receiver, if he's not actually averaging 17, to 18 fantasy points per game, then there's not going to be a huge point per game difference separate between Justin Jefferson and say a guy like Terry McLaurin around later on or even guys that are going two rounds later on like Mike Evans or Tyler Lockett that's that's the only thing so I would say Jefferson's ceiling is probably like the top five wide receiver in fantasy again I don't fucking know why but that's how I feel floor I think he's just too good to drop out of wide receiver one contention so I would say like wide receiver 12 is probably where I would see him finishing if he does hit a floor and Thielen you know goes off for another 13 touchdowns for whatever fucking reason Dalvin Cook gets a lot more touchdown luck, which is like almost impossible. But you get what I'm saying. There is a floor to be had, but it's not like a bottomed out floor. It's just a few unlucky things happening in that Minnesota offense. There you have it. You have players 13 through 24. My opinion on their ceilings and floors. My opinion is always factually correct, except for when it's wrong. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the button that looks like this right below it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing videos like this every single day. Every day. Every day. I love y'all. Uh, go download the Underdog app, please. You'll enter the BDGE NYC Draft Weekend Giveaway, which is August 27th to August 29th. I love y'all for doing so, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow. Love you. Bye.